you know, we look at um, our everyday life and we try to make changes. You know, if we, if we want to lose weight and, and get ready for that beach season coming up, right? Of course, it's going to take a while. It's like 30 degrees this morning. I don't know if it's going to come or not. But when it comes, we want to make sure that we look good at the beach, right? Get that, that body looking good. Um, but to say yes to a beach body, you have to say no to candy. And that's tough to say no to a snicker bar or Reese butter cup or some fried chicken and chopped barbecue with vinegar base. I mean, you have to say no to those good old things if you want to get in shape for the summer, right? Um, if you want to um, get up early every morning and say yes to the sunrise, You've got to say no to the late night shows like Jimmy Kimmel and all those things, right? You've got to go to sacrifice, go to sleep, uh, go to bed early so that you can get up and see the sunrise. So when you say yes to something, you're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to say no uh, to something else. Uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You know, if you say yes to Jesus Christ, then you will say no to hell. Amen? And that's got to be the best decision you can possibly make. And that's exactly what this table represents. It represents that you are agreeing with our Heavenly Father who sent down His Son and said yes to this earth and said yes to pain and suffering so that we could say no to hell. And we can say yes to our heavenly home. So as we sing our communion hymn, draw me near, may we celebrate. Celebrate in saying yes to Jesus Christ and saying no to hell. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, we are starting today sermon number 11 as we've continued a very long series in the book of Nehemiah really since the beginning of the year. And um, normally I go back and I review and I don't want to review all the way back to the very beginning. But I do want us to go back to about Nehemiah chapter 8 in an understanding. So the people of Israel, they've been oppressed. Some of them have been, been taken to other places. Nehemiah has brought them all back. They had a function to build the wall. They built the wall. They had people that were warring against them as they were building the wall, but they got all that done. The wall was built. It was complete. And then in about chapter 8, they come together and they purposed in their own heart to come and hear the Word of God be read. And so in chapter 8, Ezra brings out the Word of God and, and he starts to read. And do you remember what the people did? They wept. Because conviction hit their hearts. They hadn't heard the Word in so long. They had heard people talk, but they hadn't heard the Word be read. And Nehemiah told them as their hearts were being convicted, don't cry, today's a day of rejoicing because we're hearing the Word of God. And from there, we go into chapter 9. Now, I could have broke chapter 9 up into about three sermons in itself, but all of chapter 9 is a prayer. And so the people here, they, they come together after hearing the Word of God and they start to commit themselves together. And I'm going to start by reading chapter 9, verse 2. And then I'm going to summarize some things. But you can read through chapter 9 and see every one of these points that I'm making. It says, And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. They separated themselves. They came together as a group of believers. And they started to confess their sins. And here is the theme of what they said. They said, God, we and our fathers have sinned against you. You are creator of everything. You made everything and you made everything to worship you. You delivered our fathers from slavery in Egypt. You made a covenant with our father Abram, which became Abraham. As we were being freed from Egypt to keep us from starving... 
you provided us manna for nourishment. You just read through chapter 9, you'll see each and every one of these. And then it says this in verse 16 of chapter 9. But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to the commandments. Verse 17, And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsook them not. You see, even in all of God's people's sin, they know that God was still merciful and kind to pardon and forgive them of their sin. They go on to say, You gave us kingdoms and nations. You multiplied our children as you promised, as the number of the stars in heaven. Then he tells us in verse 31, Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keepest covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee, that thou hast come upon us, and our kings, and our princes, and our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all the people since the time of the king of Assyria unto this day. What they're saying is we understand why we've gone into bondage. We understand why we're being punished, God. But then they come at the very end of this chapter. If you would, read verse 39 with me. 38. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. Chapter 8, they ask to hear the Word of God, and they listen to it. And as they listen to the Word of God, the Word of God, not a man, not someone reading, but the Word of God convicted their hearts. They began to, to weep because of what the Word meant to them and where they knew they were in their lives. And so all through chapter 9, we see them going to God in prayer, saying, You are the great God. They repeated the promises that God gave them. They repeated an understanding. They know why they ended up in bondage. And on the top of all of it, they say, Thank you, God for being a merciful God. And notice what these people did. They came together and made and signed a covenant that you are our God and we shall be your people. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I love you and I praise you and I ask you now as we're at this time of our service, God, you just use me as your messenger. God, may nothing I have prepared be spoken. But God, may the words that you want spoken today through the power of your Holy Spirit here with us. Allow the living Word of God to be spoken as I read it, Lord, and allow your Spirit to meet each one of us in our lives exactly where we are. And God, if we are full of the Spirit, Lord, may you just fill us with joy. Lord, if we have sin that's in the way, may you convict our hearts and remove it. But either way, Lord, may we be fulfilled and returned to your loving arms, for we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I want you to think about this. For so long, these people have come together and they have slaved, really. They worked. They've been building the wall and they didn't even know what they were doing. You know, it's kind of like what we do sometimes on our mission projects local we do. We get a whole bunch together, we're going to build something, and we might have one or two that really know what we're doing, and everybody else is just waiting to hit something with a hammer. You know, you just want to come together and do it. But here they built these walls. They had trouble. People were trying to fight them or trying to kill them, always threaten them. They had come together. They had done this great success. And so for the last months, they've been going and going and going. You know, I know some people that have been going and going and going their whole life. Amen. We get in this habit of going and going and going. But the people decided, hey, we need to take a time to think a minute. And so in chapter 9, they stopped and they thought and they went to the Lord in prayer. You know, we get caught up in our everyday routine. First thing I want you to understand today is let's take a minute. Let's just take a small minute and think. You know, in one of our projects uh, in Ecuador, 
we tore down a kitchen and we were going to rebuild this kitchen. We were told, you know, communication is a wonderful thing. And uh, I only know Bell Arthur English. All right. So that's a limited English ability even. And I only know Bell Arthur English. And so if you can imagine me, the only one I know speaks worse Spanish than me is Brad. All right. I'm going to tell you, Brad speaks some bad Spanish. But uh, anyway, so we have a communication barrier. And even though we've got translators in there saying, yeah, we've got the lumber. Are you sure before we tear this kitchen down? Oh, yeah, we've got the lumber. So we, we tear that thing down. And then they tell us the next day we show up to work and they say, yeah, the lumber's two miles from here in the jungle. <laughs> and so we walk those two miles to get to another house that's in the jungle that we have to tear down to get the lumber from. All right. So uh, we're getting the, the, the timbers underneath. So what's good. My whole point of where I'm going with this, there's a two mile trip that by hand, by walking, we have to bring these beams out. And so we're loading the kids up, two, two beams to two kids and let them go. You know, it's good to watch them work. Works good for everybody. <laughs> but as I'm walking this long trail, there's about 400 yards where there are ants, big as you can just imagine, and they're walking the same trail, millions of them, and they're working. Man, they are working. Each one of them has got a leaf, a piece of a leaf about the size of my thumb, thumb tip that they've cut off, and they're carrying it back to their, their big home, their building. And the ones that drop it off, they just turn around and they go back. Ants are industrious, aren't they? They just keep working and keep working. They don't really ask any questions. In fact, when you step on about 10 of them, their brothers just come pick them up with what they had, and they just keep right on going. <laughs> But I'm noticing these ants back and forth, you know, and I don't tell the kids because then they'd be dropping the timbers and all those kind of things. But these ants are just going. And I notice on about the third trip in, I see where they're going to their nest. And so here's their big nest and five foot away from it is the same leaf that these people are walking. I mean, these ants are walking 400 yards to go cut down another one. You see, sometimes in life, we get so busy in the going, 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 we lose sight of common sense things. I thought if one of those ants could just sit back and see, we don't have to go all the way down there. What we need is right here. You know, there's times in life we have to step away from life and just think a minute. We have to take a view from back to look and see exactly where we are. Nehemiah gives us this example, and his people had been busy, 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 but now it was time to step back, and when they did, they saw they weren't where they wanted to be spiritually. You know, so many times we're working very hard when what we need to do is to take a step back and rest and allow God to show us what is right in front of our eyes. Nehemiah's people see the Word. They take a step back. You know... I can't, I couldn't give you enough example about this if I were to use my own life. I remember um, 19 years old getting my full-time job in the fire department, 18 really, getting ready to turn 19. And I remember so many people telling me things of wisdom. You know, hey, you don't want to do this, do this, you know, watch yourself. But I knew everything, you know. As all of us 18, 19 year olds always do, we know absolutely everything, you know. And I worked every day I could. I worked up to four, sometimes five jobs because I was just going to get it. I was going to win in this game of life, you know. Luckily, I had a good wife, Melody, that stood by me through all of this. And my excuse was I was taking care of her and my kids. But the fact of the matter is I just got more and more focused on doing work and really had no purpose. You see, we're all at different stages of our life, and all of us have worked before where we've been doing something because it seems like the normal thing to do, but there's no purpose behind it. And if you don't know what your purpose is, if you don't know what you're doing right now is bringing fulfilling purpose, take a break. Step back for a minute. Ask yourself this simple question. What am I here for? God did not make mistakes. He did not put you here as a mistake. He put you here for a distinct purpose for Him. And if you are not feeling fulfillment for that purpose, then stop what it is you're doing. Take a break and go to the Lord as Nehemiah's people did and say, God, what is it you have me to do? 
You see, they took a break. They stepped back. They said, we've got to get fulfillment back in our lives. And they started that by going to God's Word. I promise you this. I've done it in my own life, and I've counseled, I know, hundreds under this same thing. If you are looking for fulfillment, if you are looking for satisfaction in your life, and you do not have Jesus Christ in giving that to you, then you're just wasting your life. You can look in your career. You can look in business. You can look in trying to find relationships. You can look in all of these different places. But until you find Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you shall not be fulfilled. You might find temporary satisfaction, but that's what it'll be. It will be temporary, but Jesus Christ is forever. And so they took time to step back and to look and to get their relationship right with the Lord. We know that because we look at that prayer. They said, God, you are the God who created us, the God that loves us. And they talked about their sin and how God is merciful and gracious and received them back in their sin. And then notice what they did again. They wrote a covenant. They decided to get serious about what the Word of God says. You know, I remember the first papers I signed that were really big to me was buying a car and then buying a house. You know how you get like 35 papers you got to sign? You kind of take your time there. You know, I remember all, the lawyers always shoving in front of you, just sign here, sign here. I'm like, whoa, buddy, this is more money I'll ever make in my life. You want me to sign this paper? <laughs> I, want to I don't understand these words either. You know, they had to get two or three lawyers to, to explain, again, Bell Arthur English to me. But when we put our signature on something, it becomes serious. Notice what they did. They decided to sign a covenant. It says at chapter 9, the last verse again, verse 38, And because of all this we make a sure covenant, and we write it with our princes, Levites, priests, seal upon it. If you look at chapter 10, the verse 27 verses, the first verses 1 through 7, what you're going to see is you're going to see that there are 22 priests that signed this covenant. After that, there's 17 Levites, which is the family the priests come out of. After that, there's 44 other leaders, family leaders and community leaders that went and signed this document. And then I want you to look in chapter 10, verse 28 with me. It says, And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nithium, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding. Notice what these people did. They said, I've got to move myself from the world, and I'm making a commitment to God. You know, I, I have to think about a written commitment. When I think of John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. And I think of God making that covenant with us, and He signing it with Jesus' blood. Man, what a love He has for us. But they got serious. Third thing I want us to look at, it's where I'm going to focus our attention for the last 10 minutes, is exactly what they got serious about. Look at verse number 29, and then we're going to read into 30. They clave to their brethren, the nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law. This is what they were signing. To walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and His judgments and His statutes. And then the first thing they said is it's going to affect our homes. We make a covenant to God that we're going to follow God in our homes. Verse number 30. And that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. You know, some people incorrectly take this piece and they say it's racism that's in the Bible. That's not what it says at all. God did in the Old Testament. He gave Israel His chosen people. He told them to stay within their families. The reason was is He didn't want them pulled away to all the false gods. And so they said what they're going to do here, they're going to follow God in their own homes. They're going to listen to the words that God had given them in the Old Testament. They're not just going to allow their kids to mix with the crowd where everything is okay. You know, we're living a day to day that we can't let our kids just go out and mix in the crowd where everything's okay. If so, you can expect your child to come home and be the world. It's just where it is. You know, the truth is we can try to do everything we can for our kids and keeping them in just the right mix and just the right friends and they still can end up falling victim to the world. 
But I promise you this, if you do nothing and just say, go, everything's okay, they're going to go, and everything is not going to be okay. Billy Graham once said in one of his evangelist events, the loss of America is being lost in the home. Because you see, that's where it happens. It doesn't happen in government. It happens first in our own homes. And after we lose in our homes, then we lose in business and we lose in our government. So the promises, the commitment they said is, first of all, we're going to follow God in our homes. Secondly, in verse 31, they said, we're going to follow God in our business. And if the people of the land bring where and any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it on them on the Sabbath or the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year in the exation of every debt. This is several things that had to deal with the Sabbath, but it was going into an understanding of how business was to be. And if we would understand the time and the day, there's not refrigerators, there's no preservatives. You can't buy a McDonald's Happy Meal that'll last six months. That's true, by the way. If you don't believe me, just buy one, set it up on the counter six months from now. It looks exactly the same. You should think about that when you put it in your body. I'm just saying. But secondly, other than saying we're going to follow God in our homes, they said we're going to follow God in business. These people needed food daily. It wasn't like what we have. They had to work. They had to do certain things that would even be on the Sabbath. But they said, you know what? We're going to honor God in everything we do in all of our business. You know, I know of many a businessman, businesswomen. And, uh, you know, I, I know some that would go to church every Sunday, but when you would see them during the week, their business would not line up with what their belief has said on Sunday. You see, we can't be two different people. We've got to be the same. And so what they're saying is we're going to follow God in our homes. We're signing an agreement. We're going to follow God in business in a godly manner. And then lastly, the last verses of this chapter 32 through 39 say we're going to follow God or we're going to make a commitment to follow God in the house of God. Now I'm going to go through these verses really fast to prove a, a point. Verse 32 it says, And also we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with a third part of the shekel for the service of, notice what it says, the house of God. Verse 33, For the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering and the Sabbaths and the new moons for the set feast and the holy things and for the sin offering to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. And we cast the lots among the priests the Levites and the people for wood offering to bring it into the house of our God. What I want you to see in these verses is nine times they said we are committing to the house of our God. They talk about things like their tithe. They talk about things like taking care of the priest. They talk about things that God said you have a responsibility to do for the house of your God. But my message to you is not about this church. Because today Galatians tells us that the house of God is the body of a believer. You see, our bodies are the very temple of God now. And so they made, they said, we're going to follow God in, in, at home, we're going to follow God in business, and we're going to follow God when it has to deal with His house. You know, I asked somebody the other day, and I even brought it up in our early service this morning, if I love to drink, would I be bringing my alcohol into church? If I love to do drugs, would I bring my drugs into church? If I love to be in an adulterous relationship, would I just want to bring it inside the church? If I wanted to, to cheat and steal and lie, would I want to do all of that inside the church? And the answer of everybody would say, obviously, no. But you know what? If our bodies are the temple of God, then every time we take part in any of those things, we are bringing the house of God there. Let me give you this analogy. This past week I've been teaching my Bible class about the Holy Spirit. And the best analogy I can tell you about the Holy Spirit, Ben, you'll know this from just teaching discipleship, is an analogy of a cup. You know, I love coffee, and I got a big coffee cup. As big as I am. That ain't too big for some of y'all, I know. But I got a big coffee cup, okay? And I fill it to the very top with coffee. I mean, it's usually spilling over on the counter. Melody gets on me about that. But I fill it with coffee because I love coffee. I also love Dr. Pepper. And what I can't do is if I've got a full coffee cup, I can't pour Dr. Pepper in there, can I? It won't go. There's no room. You see, our bodies are the temple of God. And we are promised as believers 
that the Holy Spirit is now in our body. But our bodies don't have to be full of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we've got just a little bit of the Spirit in that cup, and we're allowing the world to fill the rest of us. You see, the way God wants us to live, the more we live for Him, the more of the Holy Spirit that fills inside the house of God, our bodies, our temples, the more we live an honoring and pleasing life for Him. And you know, we really can lose and gain the Holy Spirit. Here's how it happens. If I'm full of the Holy Spirit, but I decide to allow sin to enter my life, that sin's going to push some of the Spirit away because they can't be at the same place. I'm not saying I'm losing my salvation. I'm saying that I'm losing part of the Holy Spirit's guidance in my life. I don't know about you. I want to walk around with a full cup. I want to be full of the Spirit. And so what they are saying when they, they got serious, they said, we're going to follow God in our homes. We're going to follow God in business. And for everything we do, everything I go to, I'm going to honor the house of God. You know, I'm just going to, going to uh, bring us to a close here, Kathy, if you would get ready to play for us. I know that there are some people in here that are fulfilled with God in your life. There's joy all around you. You're loving it. And it's a great place to be. I know the spiritual highs I've had in my life, there's nothing better. I, I'm like screaming and just dragging not to leave it. But there's times we just leave it. But I also know that there's some real pain and some real hurt in this group of believers, this body, as we're sitting here right now. And part of it is we're constantly trying to be just like those ants, to just keep everything in our grips and control it all. And let me tell you, you're in control of nothing. Did you hear what I just said? You're in control of nothing. God's in control of it all. And so we're like those ants and we're just running and we're out of control and we lose what our purpose is. And God is sitting right in front of us saying, step back and see me. Would you accept my peace? into your life. I don't care what you're going through. This is God. He says, I don't care what you're going through. He says, I don't care what you've done. I made you and I love you. Would you step back away from that line of being busy and just accept me back into your life? You know, some of us, that's exactly where we need to be today in our lives. We're the little ants running crazy. We really think we got a purpose, but we don't even know what it is. And God's saying, step back. See me. Accept me back into your life fully. Let me fill you with the Spirit. Let me give you purpose. Let me bring you fulfillment. And then it's not a matter of following God's rules. It's never about rules. If we look that we're doing things to follow God's rule, your relationship isn't right anyway. We do these things because we love God. And we know it brings him honor and pleases him.